we've been talking about the church. What it is. Well, we found a lot of things about the church. But the thing that I want to emphasize, and I think really that I have missed what I'm trying to get across if I haven't gotten this across, and that is that we're the church. Christian people compose the body of Christ upon this earth. You understand this? And if there are no individuals, then there's no visible church. And if the church is made up of weak individuals, then of course you've got a weak congregation. You see what I'm talking about? On the other hand, if the congregation or the church is made up of knowledgeable people, then you've got an educated, knowledgeable church. All right, if the church is made up of uh, cowards, people that don't have any backbone, don't have any spunk, then of course you've got a cowardly church. If the congregation or the church is made up of stingy people, then of course you've got a stingy congregation. I mean, there's no doubt about it. This is logical. If we are the church, and nobody will deny this because the Bible teaches We've been talking about this every night. And this is the thing that I'm trying to get across. We're not going to build congregations and we're not going to build churches until we build individual lives because they underline this visible church. In other words, the church is what we are. You understand? Now, take your Bibles. I'm going to turn to a couple of passages tonight and then we'll just uh, leave it, basically. But turn with me into 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you remember we introduced this the other night about the stone that was rejected of the builders. Now, now in verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 2, the Apostle Peter says something about us. He says, But ye are an elect race. An elect race. Now, when you go home tonight and study this and take a piece of paper, list these down in order. I'm a man that believes in more than simply reading the Bible. I don't believe that reading the Bible is sufficient. I believe that you've got to study and meditate upon it. Look what he said. He says that we are an elect race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. Some translation says a peculiar people. I think the King James says a peculiar people. Now that's the word that I want to look at. And I've got Webster here. And let me turn over to Mr. Webster and find out what that word means. Now, ladies and gentlemen, little words are vehicles of thought. And if we cannot understand or if we do not understand words, the meaning of words, we'll never understand and grasp the thought that the writer or the speaker intended to convey through the use of that word. Now, I've said time and time again that this Bible is a literary product. God in His infinite wisdom saw fit to talk to us in language. I suppose that He could reveal His message any way that He wanted to, but apparently He did. This is the way He chose to do it. In a grammatical way, he used verbs and adverbs and nouns and pronouns and conjunctions and all of these other things. He used sentences and statements and declarative statements and participles and infinity. We can find all of this because this is the way that we communicate with one another. So unless we understand words, unless we look at these words carefully, we'll miss the message that God is trying to convey to us. Now, this word peculiar, we are a peculiar people. What does that mean? Does that mean that all religious people are peculiar? No, no. Because all people that are religious are not God's people. Right. All people in the world are religious. We're religious by nature. But God made us a separate nation, just like He made the Jew a separate nation. And He says that we are elect. He elected us. We found out last Sunday morning that this happened from the very from the very beginning of the world. In His eternal purpose, God elected us. He set out a plan and He said certain people will meet the standards of that plan and therefore I'm electing them right now to 
if he conformed to the image of my son. We found this. But a peculiar people. Let's see what Webster said. Of only one person, thing, group, <coughs> or country, distinctive, exclusive. In other words, a peculiar people is a distinctive, exclusive people. One people. Not like everybody else. Listen to me now. One person, one people. All right? They're particular. They're unique. A peculiar people is a special person. Out of the ordinary. Listen to me. Queer. Odd. Strange. Isn't that something? Something belonging to only one only as a privilege. A church or a parish under a jurisdiction other than that of the diocese in which it's located. Strange. You see all of these terms that this word peculiar means? We're strange people. We're queer people. We are a separate people. We're one people. I suppose if anything that I can remember as a child that lodged in my mind that I heard my mother say, this stuck more than anything else. We're not like other people. She used to tell us this. We might be poor, but just because we're poor, we don't have to live like other people. She used to tell us that. And I used to think that, and I believed that, and I looked around. We always had on clean clothes. Our hair was always combed or we went to school. We never went to school barefooted, though we didn't have very many pairs of shoes. If we had one a year, that was something. And we'd get on the bus and pull our shoes off and go barefoot all day long. But before we came home, we put our shoes back on because we knew that that's not the way we lived. You see what I'm talking about? We were different. Mama told us that we were different. And she didn't only say that, but she began to live that. And she lived that before us. We are different people. We don't lie. We don't steal. We don't take things that we ought not to. We don't sit out the table and begin to eat before other people start to eat. This is what this means. God says that we are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. Now we've already exegeted this passage one time before, but when we were dealing with it, we looked at that called you out of. Remember that called out? That's the ecclesia. That's the called out body. We're the church. Now, are we, are we a peculiar, odd people? Well, let's turn back and see. Into the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 15. And this is a little uh, test that we can apply to ourselves. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 13, if I remember correctly, Jesus makes the statement that every plant that my heavenly Father planted not shall be rooted up. Is that the verse? Matthew 15, verse 13. Every plant that my heavenly Father planted not shall be rooted up. Now, brethren, I ask you this question. And I put the monkey on your back. All of the different churches that we've got in the world. And they say that there's upward of 1,500 different kinds. There are 50 different kinds of Baptists. I was laying in the bed last night, or lying in the bed, thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight. And I looked back into our little county seat up in Missouri where we live. In other words, the seat of our county, Dade County, 1,300, 1,400 population. And this is true of hundreds and thousands of little towns across the country. And I started out on East Main in my mind's eye, and I came down through town. And the first church that I saw was a holiness church, a Pentecostal church. Then I came on downtown, and there was a Presbyterian church. 
And then I came on down next to the post office and there's the big First Baptist Church. And then I go up one block in front of that one and there's the Free Will Baptist Church. And right across the street from that one on the same block is the Faith Baptist Church. And then I go out on the highway across from the supermarket and there is another Baptist church. Alright, in between there's a Methodist and there is a Christian church and there is a Church of Christ and there is an outreach ministry and there's another Church of Christ outside of town. In a little town of 12 to 13 to 1400 people, I already listed 12 to 14 congregations, didn't I? Now, I can do the very same thing to Polk County. We're right on the line, and I can go to Stockton, and it's the very same thing. A Catholic church, a Lutheran church, a Methodist church, a Baptist church, a Mormon church. You see what I'm talking about? Now, all of these are plants, religious plants. They're spiritual institutions. They're religious institutions. They're peculiar institutions because they are not political or civil institutions. Right. Therefore, they've got to be spiritual institutions. But God said that every plant that His Father planted not would be rooted up. Now, the question that I raise tonight is, are you willing to take the position that God has planted all of these diverse, peculiar churches that all started at a different time and a different place and all of them teaching a different doctrine right. and none of all of them claiming to be Christians but none of them will have fellowship one with another? All of them saying that the other is a Christian but will refuse to eat with them at the Lord's table? Now people don't tell me that you think that I'm as good as you are if you won't sit down at the table and eat with me. You understand what I'm talking about? Don't tell me that you think that we're equal if you treat me unequal. I don't believe any such thing. Now we cannot say that we believe that these different congregations of religious organizations across the country have been planted by God, by God because if God planted them, they would all be alike. Amen. Every one of them would preach the very same thing. I don't have to go inside to find out that they're not teaching the very same thing. The very fact that they've got a different name outside means that they're trying to distinguish themselves from somebody else. I want you to know that we're a Baptist church and not a Methodist, and that's why we've got the name Baptist out here in the front. And the Methodist says, we want you to know that we're Methodist and not Presbyterian because that's why we've got that name out there. Right. If there is no difference, then why don't we all call every one of them the very same thing? They will become highly indignant if you walk in there and call that Methodist church a Presbyterian church. I'm a right or wrong. Man. Now right down here, four or five blocks on the corner of Dickerson Road and Trinity Lane are two little restaurants. Almost alike. One of them, one on one side, is the Bristol. And the other side over here is White Castle. Now, we stop in there every once in a while, and the first time I ever went in there, I slipped. And I walked up to the counter, and I said, we'd like to have two or three crystals. Boy behind the counter looked at me and said, you mean white castles. You're not in the crystal. Right. This last week, we dropped in there again. I went up there, and he said, what would you have? I said, give me two crystals. He looked at me, and he said, you're not in the crystal. Am I right or wrong? Right. You see what I mean? Names mean something, people. Now don't tell me that these people claim to be the same thing. The very fact that they've got different names indicates that they teach different and they don't want to be identified with somebody else. Amen. Don't call this Presbyterian a Methodist. Don't call this Methodist a Baptist. Well, if they're all right, what difference does it make? That's what I want to know. Jesus says that every plant that my heavenly Father planted not shall be rooted up. Now, let's just talk from the standpoint of the spiritual for a minute. I'm not talking about people that don't believe in God. I'm not talking about irreligious people. I'm talking about religious people tonight. What do they say in common? Every one of them says that basically it does not make any difference what you believe. Amen. In other words, even though we're not a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian, the Catholic says, at the very same time, there is a possibility 
that you can be saved in there. Now this is what the Holy is saying. The Baptists will say that the Methodists are all right. The Methodists will say the Presbyterian is all right. The Presbyterian will say that the Lutheran is all right. The Lutheran will turn around and say that the Pentecostal churches are all right. Now that's kind of odd. That's kind of odd that somebody would say that. Right. In other words, what you're saying is that you believe something that a person does not have to believe. In other words, are those people teaching what God said? Did God plant those? Oh yes, God planted those. Then why don't you believe that? Why don't you accept that doctrine? Well, I, I just don't believe. In other words, you don't believe what God said. You're not willing to accept what God planted. Now brethren, listen to me. That's the common thing among denominations. But when you come down to Christian people, I'm talking about people that really know the difference in the true church and denominationalism. What do we say? We say, no. Those churches are not right. Man. You mean to tell me, Brother Rudd, that you don't believe the Baptist church is right? No, I don't believe it's right. Do you believe the Methodist church is right? No, I don't believe it's right. Do you believe that the homeless churches are right? No, I don't believe they're right. You're kind of an odd fellow, aren't you? That's what Webster said the word peculiar means. Odd. Kind of strange. It's strange that you stand out among all these other people. Now, a few years back, I was taking a class in public relations at Peabody College, graduate class. And there were two or three preachers in there. And they knew that we were preachers. Uh, there was a Baptist preacher, and there was a Christian church preacher, and some other kind of preachers. But in a way, the professor got up, and he would try to make his lessons apply to all of us. In other words, we had some school teachers in there, we had some nurses in there, and we had some uh, nuns in there. And he would try to make what he said and taught us useful to all of us. And one time he was talking about what could be used in the community. What kind of organization in the community could our organizations use to help us in the promotion of our work? And he got his chalk and he walked to the board and he said, all right, somebody tell me. Well, somebody says, the fire department. The school said that. In other words, they bring the fire marshal and these firefighters in the school and they teach our little kids how to be careful, uh, how to watch for fires and fire drills, and that's good in school. You can use them. You see what I'm talking about? So he goes all the way down the line, all the way down the line until he had a great number of things listed on the board. And then he turned around and he looked at these superintendents and these principals and he said, can you people accept all of these? Yes. Then he went to the Catholic nuns and he says, can you accept and utilize all of these? He said, yes. He looked at the little Baptist preacher and says, can you accept these? He said, yes. He turned over to the Christian church preacher and he says, can you accept all of these? Yes. Came to me and he kind of dropped his voice and he said, Mr. Rudd, he said, I've noticed that you haven't said anything. How many of these can you use in your work? I said, none of them, sir. Man, he thought this is quiet and remarkable upon the contrary. The pin drop. I said, now, Dr. Gosselin, if you'll give me just a little time to explain myself, I won't sound like the nut that everybody thinks that I am. He stepped back and said, Mr. Rudd, you've got all the time that you want to explain your position. Well, I took four or five minutes to explain what the church was, what the mission of the church was. In other words, we've got a different mission than the school. Our mission is spiritual. Our mission is the saving of people's souls, the salvation of lost people. Amen. And I said, how in the name of reason can I turn my work of trying to save souls into the hands of people whose soul is not saved? How can I tell people that you want to listen to this man tell you how to become a child of God when he himself is not a child of God? Man. After class was over, he came up to me and caught me as we was going outside. And he said, Mr. Rudd, he said, I knew exactly what you believed. And he said, that's why I call on you particularly because I wanted the class to hear what you believed. 
we're exclusive. You see that? I was the odd man out in that class. And there were dozens of people in there. You understand that? The only one that stood out that said, no, I don't believe that. I don't believe in these sectarian bodies. Now, what is the church? What it is? Well, the church is made up of people that are peculiar. They're peculiar because they understand where they stand. They understand why they're Christians. And we used to could say that. But people, this thing that we call churches of Christ today have become just about as sectarian as the sectarian and therefore I cannot speak anymore. I never will forget or speak for them anymore. I never will forget when I first began to preach in the late 40s and the early 50s. Now think about it. I'm talking about 40 years ago. The man who baptized me was a great debater. And back in those days, we had to debate. This was one of the ways of preaching, was debating. And he told me, he says, Don, whatever you do, now listen to me, he said, I was a young man. He said, whatever you do, don't ever sign a proposition to defend the practice of the churches of Christ. Now, don't ever put your name to a proposition that you will affirm that the church of Christ is scriptural in origin, name, doctrine, and practice. He said, leave off that practice. He said, sign your name to any proposition to anybody that the church of Christ is scriptural in origin, name, doctrine. But he said, I'm ashamed to say, as you get out here and travel around, that you're going to find that the churches practice about anything that they're big enough to practice and don't ever set yourself to defend them. Right. You see what I'm talking about? Now, brethren, all I know is the Bible said that we are a peculiar people. We are an elect nation. And we've got to get ourselves in harmony with God's law. We've got to understand this. I want you people to understand. You're not going to come into the church under the teaching of Don Rudd, have faith, thinking that these churches out here are right. They're not right. There's not a one of them right. Amen. You understand that? Right. There is not but one church, and that church is the body of Christ. And we constitute that body of Christ when we obey God Almighty. And when we fail to obey God Almighty, we fail to become that church. On the other hand, even if we start off well like this, and if we deviate aside, swerve aside, step outside the path, we will cease to be a New Testament church because the God of heaven will refuse to accept us if we refuse to stay exclusive. See that? That's what that word peculiar means, exclusive. That's right. So, don't get the idea that you can hold on to the Baptist or the Methodist or the Presbyterians with one hand and put your other arm around Jesus Christ. These churches are going to be rooted up. Every plant that my heavenly Father planted on shall be rooted up in the day of judgment. You see that? But just like I said this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we had dilly dallied around with the sectarians. And our preachers had backed off. And we had not told our young people that it's a sin and wrong to marry outside the church. And we haven't talked to them and we haven't worked with them. And we don't, they don't know what it means to grow up, to be God's people and to keep a pure line here for God Almighty. And therefore, we are marrying sectarians and we're bringing them to church. And these sectarians have corrupted the internal workings of the church. Amen. See what I mean? We've got men that don't like this kind of preaching because they're married to women who don't like it. Right. We've got sisters in the congregation that don't like this kind of preaching because their husbands are members of sectarian bodies. Now people, I feel for you. I can understand this. But let me say that your situation does not change the truth of the gospel. Right. The gospel is just exactly like it is. And just because you have a son or a daughter who has married someone out of the sectarian churches does not mean that we're going to stifle the mouth of preacher and he refuses to preach out on these things. See what I'm talking about? It doesn't make any difference people. We've got some of the greatest people in the Bible whose children didn't do right. Samuel's children didn't do right. Amen. Aaron's children didn't do right. Moses' children did not do right. 
I didn't change God's law in the least. What we've got to do is to stay straight. Right. As a peculiar people. What are we? We're a peculiar people. We're a fighting people. We're soldiers. We constitute the army of God Almighty, as I said this morning. We've got a shield of faith around us. We believe what we believe. And we believe it with all of our heart. We believe it to the extent that we're late really to lay our lives down for it. You know, I've been preaching for these yay many years about what was happening to the church. And my brethren just won't believe it. I just have preached it and preached it and preached it and they still won't believe it. We want to do everything like the people round about us. This is what led the Jews to get a king because they were not satisfied with God's judges. Amen. Am I right? right? We want to be like the people round about us. Now, what have we done? Well, the sectarians have set up a pseudo-political religious organization. Set up. And they had gotten out here and they had gotten an, uh, approval from the government to be tax exempt. Now, what does that mean? What does tax exempt mean? You heard me talking about the IRS revoking the tax exempt status of some of the organizations of Jerry Falwell or the Mormon church. Our Tony Alama, you heard me talk about it. Now, what am I talking about? In other words, you set up an organization out here that meets the standards of the IRS. And people who give money to that organization can knock off that contribution on their income tax. Well, simply because we were not willing to preach on giving as we ought to, and I, brethren, were pre afraid to get up and tell people that they're going to go to hell for not giving. We have come up here and borrowed from the sectarians a gimmick to raise money in the church. And that is that we will set up an organization here that when you give, you can knock it off on your income tax. I've been saying for years that if you were to revoke this income tax status that the contribution in churches of Christ would go down two-thirds. Right. I say that if a person is giving money to the church simply that he can knock it off on his income tax, you better think twice because the God of heaven is not going to accept that kind of stuff. When I first came down here, four or five years back when they went up and got me to come down here, first thing they want to know, Brother Rudd, do we need a tax number? I looked at him and I said, what do you want a tax number for? Well, you, you, you can get things without paying taxes. I said, who wants to get things for not paying taxes? I'm an auctioneer. I'm a dealer in new and old merchandise. Every place I go and go up, they say, you got a tax number? No, I don't have a tax number. What do I want a tax number for? I'll pay my taxes right now. You see this? This congregation is not tax exempt. And as long as I'm here, it never will be tax exempt. I pay 13.75% taxes on all the salaries and support that this congregation gives me. 13%. There it is. That's what I send in to the internal revenue at the end of every year. Every time we go over to depot and buy some material, if we get $100 worth, we will pay $8.75 in taxes because that's the tax. You see what I'm talking about? There you are. 8.75. That's what we pay. Every time I go up here to Ace Hardware to get a light bulb or to get nails or anything else, I pay taxes. If it's a dollar, it costs me a dollar and eight cents. The government doesn't have any control over this place. You understand that? Because we're not using them. We're not using them. See? Right. And if this is the reason why we give, and I don't believe it is, but I believe that this kind of preaching is necessary because people have never heard it. You don't hear our preachers talking about this. They're holding this stuff up. I grew up under that kind of preaching. Not this kind of preaching, that kind of preaching. Where they got up and said, now, people, if you will give, you can mark it off at the end of the year on your income tax. Well, that's wonderful. 
if the government won't let us do it. But if we've got to be a tax-exempt organization to get it, I say that you better leave it alone. See that? So I hope you brethren are listening to what I say. Now let me give you another illustration. But I'm going to show you how careful we're studying the Bible. Did you know that when Jesus was first mentioned in the Garden of Eden, I'm talking about after Adam and Eve sinned, that God came down and told Eve that she would have a son. That he said that she, he would be born of a virgin birth. Someone says, no, Brother Rudd. God says that he would be born of a virgin. Right in Matthew, uh, in Genesis chapter 3. Someone said, are you sure? Well, let's turn back there. We'll take you about what we're studying tonight. This will be well for us to understand. Turn into Genesis chapter 3. And let's see what we have. Alright? Let's go down to about verse 14. Jehovah said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed thou thou above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shall thou go, and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Someone said, Brother Rudd, I don't see any virgin birth of Christ there. I do. S-E-E-D. I said that if you're going to study this Bible, you're going to have to look at words. Women don't produce seed. The male produces the seed. That's right. Ever think about that? Right. In an in a ordinary physical conception, the woman produces the egg, the male produces the seed. Alright? Right. But in this particular case, he reversed the order. Brother Harding, did you ever think about that? Look at it. He said, the seed of woman. In other words, this will be a peculiar conception from the very concept. Right. Isn't that beautiful? The seed See what I'm talking about? Now, people, when God says every plant that my Heavenly Father does not plant will be rooted up, that's exactly what He meant. He meant that in the day of judgment, every one of these spiritual institutions would be lost. And people that have lived them, hoping to be saved, will be lost. I'm willing to put my name to the dotted line and affirm against any man living. It doesn't make any difference who he is. I'll just use the Baptist as an illustration, but it's applicable to the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Holiness, the Lutherans, the Mormons, anything else. I will affirm that the Baptist Church is a spiritual institution. And since it is a spiritual institution, its essential head and owner is Satan. And every person who becomes a member of it and remains in it till death will be lost. Now let somebody put their name to that proposition and change it to the Church of Christ. That the Church of Christ is a spiritual institution where the devil is a chain. Now people, there's not the two spiritual forces in the world. One of them is Jesus and the other is Satan. Now if Jesus is not the head, then Satan has to be. That's right. Am I right? Alright now, you're going to take a position, you're going to have to take a position on sectarianism that it's either from God Almighty, our Satan is the head of it, one or the other. And the majority of my brethren across the brotherhood have already taken that position and they backed off and said, Brother Rudd, I wouldn't say what you're saying. We don't necessarily believe what they teach, but I wouldn't go so far to say that as a spiritual institution, Satan is their head. You see the compromise? You see the compromise right there? Right. Now, either Satan is the head or Jesus is the head, one or the other. And if Jesus is the head, they constitute his body because Jesus is the head of his body and only his body and nobody else. Right. In Ephesians chapter 1, God gave him to be head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. To be in the church is to be in the body. To be in the body is to be in the church. You're baptized into the body. You're baptized in the church. Jesus is the head of the body. He's the Savior of the church. You're baptized into it. He's the Savior. 
knows ever baptized. Now, people, this is how simple it is. We're peculiar people. This is odd preaching. This is queer preaching. You don't hear this every place, do you? Now, see what I'm talking about? Now, as we talk this morning about these Jews, God did not permit those Jews to go out there and mix and mingle with everybody else. And He doesn't intend for us to mix and mingle with everybody else. He means for us to be an elect people, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, somebody that He Himself is proud of. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if there is not a difference in the church, then tell me why He employed that word ecclesia, the called out body. I want to know what we're called out of. We're either called out of the world or we're not. There's not but two spiritual spheres, and that is the church and the world. Well, you say, of course, Brother Rudd, we're called out. All right, I want to know where sectarianism is. Where is the Baptist church and the Methodist church? Where is the status? Where is the location of it? Are they in the world? If they're out of the world, then we're called. If they're in the world, we're called out of them. If they're not in the world, they're in the church. If you don't have to leave them, then they're in the church. Right. See that? That's what people don't know. This is what the brethren are refusing to admit. We don't know what sectarianism is. We don't know what denominationalism is. Why? Because we don't know who we are. See that? We don't know who we are. We don't know who the enemy is. How in the name of reason can we fight if you don't even know who the enemy is? Right. What kind of a soldier can we be if we don't even know who we're to fight out here? Am I to fight the Masons? I don't know. Ask the brethren. They don't know. Religious institutions? I know, Brother Rudd. Take their books. Turn to page 27 of the Tennessee Craftsman. Turn to page 27 of the introduction. It says the Masonic Lodge is indeed a religious organization. Right. And that you can go to heaven by being a member of it. Right. Don't tell me this kind of stuff. I've fought the Masons all across this country. And we've got brethren that are Masons in the church. And they don't even know what the church stands, what the, what the Masonic Lodge stands for. See, I've been preaching this for 40, 50 years around this country. And still we've got brethren that don't understand. Sure, this is what I'm saying. We're ignorant people. We don't know who the enemy is. What am I saying? We don't know what the target is. The reason why we don't know what sin is, because we don't know what the target is. We don't know whether we hit it or whether we missed it. We can't even see the target. We're so nearsighted that we can't see it. How do you know whether you hit the target or not? Here's what I'm trying to get across. We've got to know. We've got to get back to this kind of preaching. What are we talking about? Sigma Freud. What are you listening to? Poetry. All of this kind of stuff. Come together. You know what they're doing at Madison today? I could care less, but just to tell you, they've got billboards all over town. Today is New Baby Day. New Baby Day. Ain't that nice? Stand up, all of you women who've had a baby this last year. Stand up, all of you women who are grandmothers ten times. This is the kind of stuff that's going on in the church. Stand up this morning and take the neighbor next to you by the hand and look him in the eyes and say, I love you. Amen. This kind of junk. This is what's going on in the name of religion. Let's make us a chain. Make a chain. A chain of hands. Some of these days, the churches of Christ, if somebody will come up with an idea, will suggest that we outline Davidson County, probably on Briley Freeway or Old Hickory Boulevard. It's 50 miles around Nashville, Tennessee, in Davidson County, and Old Hickory Boulevard. And I had a young couple tell me one time, they started out, said, we want to know how far it was, and they drove one Sunday afternoon, and it was 50 miles from Old Hickory Boulevard to Rackham. Some of my brethren will get the wise idea that that'll be something, so let's get hands. All the churches get together. We'll bust them into a certain place. A good place to start will be Madison. That's where they'll start. And we'll hold hands, and we'll have a 50-mile chain around. Isn't that something? It'll happen. It'll happen. Because we don't know what the church is. We don't know who we are. Now, people, this is peculiar. If you don't believe it, you get out here and mix with the brethren and let them find out where you attend and let them ask you who your preacher is and when you say, Don Rudd, oh! There's something odd about him. He's kind of a queer duck. You mentioned him because he believes the Bible just and believe that there's just one church Amen. and that every one of us all believe the very same thing. People, if you're contemplating becoming a member of the Church of Christ, it's not just another church. It isn't one of many. It is the church. Right. 
the church. You've got to be in it to be saved. And everybody in the hobby is lost. I'm sorry, sir. That's why I preach so hard. Amen. This is why we're doing everything that we possibly can to make the world see because we believe this with all of our heart. That there is but one church. There is but one body. There's only one plant that God has planted. And if you're in any other spiritual institution, any other spiritual plant, God will root it up in the last day and it will be burned up with fire. Now, how do I get into that church? Well, I have to hear the gospel. I've got to believe it. I've got to repent of my sins. I've got to confess the name of Jesus and be baptized into it. What does that mean? That profession... That confession and that profession simply says, Lord, if you will accept me, if you will remit my sins, I dedicate my life, my soul, my everything to you. I'll live for you. That's what it means. People, it isn't easy. I want you to think twice before you step out. I want you to think twice because before you make the response. Because once you do, and then you're disappointed and turned back. You're in a worse shape than you it's better to have never known the truth than to know it and turn back. If you put your hands to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Take your time. Know what you're talking about. Know what it is. And be certain that you mean business. If you've done that, if you're ready, and you know you're ready, I'm ready to baptize you this very night. While the devil was standing, saying, I invite you.